this morning's been an unusual morning. And if you were here at practice, you would understand what I mean. Everything just went off real smoothly during our practice time this morning. But now we don't have a film. Now we don't have the words on the, the, for you to sing these last two songs we're going to do. Y'all don't have the words. Uh, and the, is mine my, dead? Oh, yay. <laughs> oh, yay. <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. I appreciate that so much because it does make a difference. And Steve picked up his mic and he, he said, all the mics are dead, he thinks. So, you know what, I was, that used to bother me. I would go home and be so upset over that, that that I thought I had completely failed. But I'm not this morning. I came in here full of the Holy Spirit. I came in here with anointing on me. I came in here with my Savior. And I'm going to sing for him no matter what. And the devil knows that. He knows that we're having a good service today. He knows that people's lives are going to be changed this morning. One life's already been changed. More lives will be changed today. And when these things happen to us, here's what we do. We fall down. We lay our crowns, anything that we have, at the feet of Jesus. And then we cry. Those same words I had y'all to say the first of the service. Holy, holy, holy. Would you say that again? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of His mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. Sing it out with us. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy. We fall down, we lay our ground at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of His mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. Sing it out. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lamb. And we cry, holy. Cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lamb. Oh, yes, he is. And we thank you, Jesus. And we thank you. Grace that flows like a river washing over me. Round of heaven, love of Christ overflowing oh, me. Thank you, Jesus. You said. vessel of your love 
This is a morning of celebration. Did you hear me? This really is a morning of celebration, a day of celebrating the coming of Christ. Who knows what today is in biblical history? What's it called? Palm Sunday. Okay. Palm Sunday is today. This was a day when Jesus came to Jerusalem, a day of celebration, a day where he, as he came in to the city, people took their coats off and they threw them on the ground. They took palm branches and they waved them and they laid them on the ground before him as he came in. They worshiped, they praised him. There was anticipation of his coming. Today marks that day of celebration for us. It does. Today is a day where we've come to worship and praise Jesus. I hope, 
I hope and I pray that that's your reason for being here. I hope that's what your focus is this morning. I hope that's what it's been. I hope it will continue. I pray that it will continue because if you remember the week that Jesus went through that week, It began on a high note, didn't it? And it went downhill from there. So this may be your high note this week as you celebrate the coming of Christ. We know that this day is kind of bittersweet for us because even as we celebrate the coming of Christ, we know that Friday's coming and the cross is coming. We know that in Jesus' day that many in that same crowd will within a few short days, five days later, they'll exchange words of praise for words of death. Shouting, Hosanna! Hosanna! And then later shouting, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! This morning, I want us to focus our attention on these two events that both focused on Christ, but with two different results. If you've got your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to take time to turn with me. We're going to be reading from two different passages this morning. Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 28. And then Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 11. Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 28. This marks the beginning of the story of Jesus coming to Jerusalem. It says, after telling this story, Jesus went on toward Jerusalem, walking ahead of His disciples. As He came to the town of Bethage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, He sent two disciples ahead. Go into that village over there, He told them. As you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks why you're untying the colt, just say, the Lord needs it. So they went and found the colt, just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked him, why are you untying the colt? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus, and they threw their garments over it for him to ride on. As he rode along, the crowds spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessing on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. He replied, If they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. But as he came closer to Jerusalem and he saw the city ahead, he began to weep. How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. But now it's too late. And peace is hidden from your eyes. Over in Matthew's Gospel, in chapter 27, We read of the account, beginning in verse 11, of what happened five days later, where the shouts of Hosanna, Hosanna to the King of Kings 
changed their tune. Now Jesus was standing before Pilate, the Roman governor. Are you the king of the Jews? The governor asked. Jesus replied, you have said it. But when the leading priest and the elders made their accusations against him, Jesus remained silent. Don't you hear all these charges they are bringing against you, Pilate demanded. But Jesus made no response to any of the charges, much to the governor's surprise. Now it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner to the crowd, anyone they wanted. This year there was a notorious prisoner, a, a man named Barabbas. As the crowds gathered before Pilate's house that morning, he asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? He knew very well that the religious leaders had arrested Jesus out of envy. Just then, as Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him this message, Leave that innocent man alone. I suffered through a terrible nightmare about him last night. <coughs> Meanwhile, the leading priest and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas to be released and for Jesus to be put to death. So the governor asked again, Which of these two do you want me to release to you? The crowd shouted back, Barabbas! Pilate responded, Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? They shouted back, crucify him. Why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. Pilate saw that he wasn't getting anywhere and that a riot was developing. So he sent for a bowl of water, washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood, the responsibility is yours. And all the people yelled back, we will take responsibility for his death, we and our children. So Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. Then he turned him, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Two events within the span of five days. Oh, how quickly the tone of the crowd changed. The great evangelist Billy Graham has often been quoted many times as saying that the greatest mission field in our country is the local church. The people already sitting in our churches you see, the truth is this, that there are many, many people who know what to say. There are many people who know how to say it. They even know how to act in life. But the truth is that there is no personal relationship with Jesus Christ. No salvation. Just empty words. And you see, these two examples that we read about this morning are perfect examples of this for us today. On Sunday, Jesus rode into the city with the people shouting praises and praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. On Friday, on Friday, they're shouting, Give us Barabbas! We want him! Crucify Jesus! Crucify Jesus! Why the change? What happened between Sunday and Friday that changed the tone? The truth is there are many possible reasons but I believe the simplest reason that we can come up with is that the words did not match the heart. You see, I believe they possessed what we might call a casual faith 
instead of a fully surrendered faith. Let me tell you what a casual faith is. A casual faith is temporal. It's convenient. It's a 911 faith. It's opportunistic. It's driven by need and circumstance. It's a faith that conforms to me, to me and my needs. In other words, it's a religion. Nothing more than a religion. That's a casual faith. Now, a fully surrendered faith, on the other hand, is a life that's completely given over to the will of God. Completely and utterly surrendered to His will. To seek His kingdom first, Not my kingdom, but His kingdom. Not my desires, but His desires. Not my will, but His will. You see, it's a faith that conforms to the heart and desires of God. It's a relationship. You see, they had religion. But they missed it completely. They missed the person of Jesus. So how is it that you and I can experience a fully surrendered faith? How can we be real and sincere and honest before the Lord? How can we be consistent in all that we do, all that we think, all that we say? Well, this morning, I simply want to offer you just a few thoughts, a few observations on what it takes to make up a fully surrendered faith and to live it out. Here's the first thought. A fully surrendered faith is not self-centered. It's Christ-centered. Does anybody other than me struggle with that? Because I, I, I can confess to you, even as the words roll off my mouth, I battle that. A fully surrendered faith is a faith that is Christ-centered. You know, it's... It, it, <laughs> truth is it sounds obvious doesn't it It sounds like well that yeah that's a given that ought to be it but can i tell you in in america in 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 our culture today we compete we we have so many things that compete with our time and our energy and our resources we have a tendency to say say okay god here's my calendar uh here's my agenda i believe i can squeeze you in here And I can squeeze you in here. I can't make it to church here, here, or here. But, uh, you you know, I I, I got time for you here. Let's let's put this down. It's kind of like pulling God out and taking and turning to Him only when it's convenient, only when He's useful to our needs. That's not a fully surrendered faith. Do you see the example in the passage? You see, the people praised Jesus as He passed by on that Sunday. And the Scripture tells us why. Why was it? Why were they praising Him? Because they had seen the miracles that He had performed. They praised Him because He was serving them. Some of them may have been a part of the crowd that was fed, the 5,000 that were fed that day. Others had perhaps been the recipient of a healing or had been witness to someone being touched and healed from blindness or someone who was lame, who was walking again. Or maybe they had just heard about it and there was interest and hope that was sparked by what they had heard. They praised Him because... 
He was meeting their needs. Second thing is that perhaps they saw in Jesus a way that they could have freedom from Rome. <laughs> this would have been a political viewpoint. Their freedom from Rome, that this is what they believed about the Messiah when He comes. He's going to rule on the throne over the world. And that the Messiah would take an earthly reign over Rome and over all that they had experienced in dealing with being subservient to the Roman Empire. To be set free. Perhaps this is what they saw in Jesus as they celebrated His coming because they thought He was going to sit as an earthly king. Their praise was tempered with the attitude of what Jesus can do for me. That's casual faith. What Jesus can do for me. Now a few days later, five days later, at the trial, things had changed. The Lord had ridden on a, a donkey, a colt, and people were praising and, and worshiping Him as He entered in. And when He was presented at the trial, he didn't look quite the same. A few days later, they saw him beaten. They saw him disfigured. They saw a man who no longer looked like a deliverer or a conqueror. And as words were said about him, they bought into all the lies and they quickly changed their position. You see, for them, it was still all about me. 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 Today, 2018, Palm Sunday, I want to encourage you. I want to plead with you to use this to choose to honor our great King. To honor Jesus Christ by surrendering to a faith that is fully and totally sold out to Him, that puts Him above and before anything else in your life, that gives Him the very best that you have, the very best that you are, without holding anything back, giving Him your all in all. That's what it means to have a Christ-centered relationship with Jesus. So the first thought is a fully surrendered faith is not self-centered, it's Christ-centered. Second thought is this, is that a, a fully surrendered faith is relationship-driven. You see, many of those who gathered to throw their coats and the palm branches onto the street and who shouted praises did so because they just kind of got caught up in it. You know how it is. Why is everybody happy? Why is everybody going, what's going on? This is fun. You know, this is the thing to do. For one brief moment, they stepped into a trend. It was the trendy thing to do. You see, hey, they took off their coat and laid it down in front of that donkey that's walking along. Got this guy riding on the back. Hey, let's get a, maybe, maybe there's something to this. And just out of, out of following the, a leader, not Jesus as a leader, just following the the view of what someone else has done. They stepped into it. Well, perhaps some of, some of the things that they were doing began with sincere motives for some, but for others, they were simply going through the motion of doing what somebody else has done. Later at the trial, when they were shouting, crucify him, that became the thing to do. What did they say? I thought, I thought this was the guy that rode in. No. They're saying crucify him. Crucify him? Why would they want to crucify him? Crucify him. Crucify him. All of a sudden they're stepping in and they're shouting along because they're a part of the crowd. 
They're under the influence of others. They're following a new trend that happened five days later. All because they didn't have a relationship. They didn't know who this Jesus was. So they were just part of what was going on. You see, in our own lives, a fully surrendered faith comes only, only through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. One where every day, every day is fresh and new. Letting Him personally direct our steps, guide our thoughts, our words, and our actions. But you see, in order to have a fully surrendered faith, we must develop and maintain a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Did you get it? Develop and maintain. Developing a relationship with Jesus Christ begins by inviting Him into your life. Inviting Him into your life. Surrendering your life to Him. Surrendering your thoughts to Him. Your will your desires. Developing that begins with making Him your Lord. You heard the passage of Scripture that I, 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 I think I, I, I misquoted this morning in the baptism, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord is the right way to say it and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you would be saved. That's the beginning point. That's where you begin the process of developing that relationship by making that confession with your mouth and believing in your heart. But then it, we have to maintain that. We have to maintain that relationship with him. How do we do it? Well, the Bible gives us instructions over and over again. John chapter 15 is a a great example where it refers to that we are to remain in Him. He says in verse 5, Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, that's maintaining that relationship, depending on the Word of God to guide you, depending on the Word of God to instruct you, depending on the Word of God to live out a fully surrendered life to Jesus Christ. So, we begin by making certain that a fully surrendered faith is Christ-centered, not self-centered. And that we're basing all of this on a personal relationship with Jesus. And our final thought this morning is this. A fully surrendered faith is not swayed or blocked, not impacted by our personal trials or crisis. And I want you to think about that. What kind of influence on your life when the bottom falls out? You know what I mean? Have you been there? Where you're going along in life and you get a a report. Or you hear of someone that you love and care for that's passed. Or you walk in one day and they hand you a pink slip and tell you you're no longer needed. Your life changes direction rapidly, on a dime. How does that impact? How does that impact your faith? Does it challenge it? You see, a fully surrendered faith is not swayed. It may buffet you, it may blow you back, but guess what? You're still standing. You're standing on the promises of Christ the King. Through eternal ages, let His praises sing. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. Doesn't matter what the enemy does to me. 
You see, at the celebration of Jesus and his entry into the city, it, it was trendy to offer praise, and everyone was doing it, but at the trial to speak out for Jesus was risky. Don't you know that there were those that were opposed to what was being shouted, but they're shouting against the majority. They're shouting against the, the biggest group that was the loudest voice. They were scared. So they cowered back. It might have even been life-threatening to them. Many of us come to Jesus expecting everything to be Good. Everything to be great. Maybe a little bit of difficulties along the way. But not too much. And then like I said, that bottom falls out of your life. And our first thought, this isn't supposed to be happening. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. You see, if our faith is casual faith, if our faith is based on circumstances and situations, our faith will falter. But if we're fully surrendered in our faith, guess what you do? You fall back into the loving arms of goodness and mercy. Because the scripture says that he will follow you all the days of your life. So no matter what the enemy brings your way, Christ is right there with you. Now, in my lifetime, I've had the privilege and opportunity to, to attend and be a part of many worship experiences. Big events, small events really small events, two or three people, where praising God and worshiping the Lord is absolutely incredible. and Everybody's praising. Everybody's excited. Everybody is pumped. Yet when I stepped out of that environment, guess what? You step back into the reality of the world. The world where you're going to face tomorrow, the hard task of living in a world that doesn't praise God. In a world that is in fact mocking and laughing and angry at God and God's people. So if you're relying on that casual faith to help you cope and deal with what the world brings your way, it's going to knock you out. A fully surrendered faith takes the good with the bad, knowing that all we are ever promised, that in the midst of both the good and the bad, <laughs> Jesus will never leave you and never forsake you. Jesus will stand with you no matter what you're facing. So I want to ask you this morning, what kind of faith do you have? Do you have a casual faith? Or is your faith fully surrendered to Him? This morning as I woke up, The Lord uh, brought a song to my mind. And I came over to the office early and I came in and grabbed a hymn book and went back and sat at my desk. And I sang it to the Lord. I can't sing it to you, but I want to read the words to you. Because it's a declaration. It's a declaration that's made to Jesus. I love songs that we sing when we sing to Him. 
my Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. In mansions of glory and endless delight, I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright. I'll sing with the glittering crown on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I want to invite you this morning To make that declaration to him. First and foremost, by stating to him, if you've never done this, Lord Jesus, come and be the Lord of my life. I surrender my life to you. And God, I want to walk in a fully surrendered faith with you. Or maybe you're here this morning and and you recognize through the comparisons that we looked at that oftentimes you're trying to live out the Christian life in more regards of a casual faith than a fully surrendered faith. And God is inviting you to step out and renew a commitment to Him and say, God, I don't want to fit you into my agenda. I want me to fit into what you want for me. I'm inviting you to make that declaration of love to Him, of telling Him that you love Him. My Jesus, I love Thee. Father God, in this moment, in this time, in this place, Lord, I pray that you could take the message that was spoken today, the message through song and the message of what you've spoken into the hearts and minds of people today. And draw us, Father, draw us closer and closer to you. Help us, Lord God, to live out a fully surrendered faith in Jesus Christ. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing page 79. Thank you. 